Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and welcome to the Martini, Candid Conversations with a Twist. And today, they're liable to get very <laughs> twisted. <laughs> My name is Gus. I'm Director of Business Development for North America, and I've been with the Erie family for over 17 years and honored to be your host today. Um, at Erie Rental, our goal is to equip you, the filmmaker, with the most inspiring image technology in the world. Our services cross borders and continents with a network of facilities in North America, Europe, and the UK bringing you first-class camera, lighting, and grip equipment, wherever you may be. Our team is there to welcome you with friendly expertise, personalized solutions, and relationships built on trust. As a friendly reminder, please send us your questions via the Q&A tab on Zoom, and we'll get to as many of them as possible during the course of the show. We are very excited to have with us today the incredibly passionate and talented cinematographer, Michael Simmons. Michael developed an interest in photography at an early age and went to the School of Visual Arts in New York City. And early on in his career, Michael started to collaborate with uh, Ramin Bahrani in, on projects including Man Push Cart, Chop Shop, Goodbye Solo, and Plastic Bag. Um, his other projects include Paranormal Activity 2, The Lunchbox, which earned nominations at BAFTA Awards and Con, Last of Robin Hood, which premiered at the 2013 Toronto International Film Festival, Nerve, the remake of Halloween, and the HBO series Vice Principals and Righteous Gemstones. And he has the upcoming Halloween Kills and untitled Henry and Rel sci-fi project for Netflix. All right, Michael, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to have you. <laughs> so um, I always like to kind of start this off with a, you know, some fun little kind of banter and stuff. And I thought I'd play a little game with you today. Sure. Totally different, something I haven't done before. <laughs> um, it's uh, going to be genre bending. Okay. So I want to see if we could kind of come up with a movie or a TV show or something that kind of was enabled to cross genres cleverly. So I'm just going to throw some mixes out at you and I want to see if you can come up with something. <laughs> Copy. All right. So a sci-fi comedy. Wait, is this a film that exists? Yes, that has like, yes. Oh yeah, sci-fi comedy. Um, <laughs> it's like it's that uh, movie with uh, Sam Rockwell and uh, they think they're in Star Wars. What's it called? <laughs> <laughs> or Guardians of the Galaxy would be the easy one. There you go. Okay, <laughs> that works. Oh, oh, you said Sam Rockwell. The first thing I saw was Moon. No. I was like, that's really a comedy. But no, no, no. Actually, a really fun one with uh, Susan, the woman from. Aliens, oh my. and oh, uh, Gal Galaxy like Quest, Ga Galaxy, Galaxy Quest. Quest. That's actually <laughs> a really fun. One. It is a fun one. It's been a long time. Like, great, perfect. Yeah. Um, Western horror. Uh, Western horror. I have no idea. You know, I used to watch three movies a day, and now I, can't, you know, I, I can't remember anything. No, I was, I was, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, good. I, uh, if you haven't seen it, Bone Tomahawk is quite disgusting. Oh, I've heard about that. <laughs> yeah. Just to throw you out there, uh, one for, uh, for later, not with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's about, the other problem. Uh, I, I go to bed at nine, so there's no time to watch anything scary. Right. Right. <laughs> um, how about a noir musical? <sighs> so boring. Um, <laughs> what a new war musical? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Go. I don't know either. <laughs> I just uh, was like, yeah. you know what? We need to make a new war musical. <laughs> uh, maybe that movie with those uh, two people dancing around Hollywood and lecturing about jazz or something is that like a new war? I've never seen it. Uh, the La La Land thing. Yeah, that movie. That's yeah, kind of a bit. I, yeah, probably not new war enough. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll have to work on that one. Yeah. <laughs> And how yeah, about a genre, a genre that nobody wants to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We could take Laura and make it a musical, you know, yeah. you could do some, take an old one and have some fun with it. Yeah. Um, how about a romance slasher? A romance, that probably does exist. <laughs> I'm thinking it does you know, in, in one of the Halloween's movies, Laurie Strode and uh, Michael Myers kiss. Ah. At the end. Ah. But I don't know if that's a romance. <laughs> Close enough. We'll we'll take that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, we'll move on from there. That was fun. I was just <laughs> <trying> to... <laughs> think of something to break the ice with. 
Um, so can you give us a, kind of just a five minute synopsis of how you got into this crazy business that we're in? <laughs> how do I get into business? You know, I have always wanted to be a cinematographer. I mean, since I was, I mean, like, since I began higher education, you know, when I was 18 or something like that, I mean, I wasn't really exposed to cameras and I had one traumatic event when I was a kid where they gave me one of these point and shoot cameras. It was like, it wasn't 35, it was like 16. It was like some weird role thing. Mm. And um, my mom yelled at me for wasting all the film, taking bad pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I always thought, think about that, about conserving imagery and time and resource. But um, so then I, you know, I went to SVA and then I kind of, it's been 20 something years since, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, I, like, um... I, I, you know, I basically shot everything I could. And then like, and I did everything everybody else did. Like we all worked on room raiders and stuff like that and kind of worked our way up. That was the best gig <laughs> in town for a long time. Uh, I was a grip on Room Raiders. And uh, it, all the DPs in New York that are around my age worked on Room Raiders. <laughs> That's funny. I'm going to have to go back and see if I can watch reruns. <laughs> well, the, 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 there was no, there was not that much work back then. You know, the, I mean, like, there was no IFC Film Center. There was no, you know, there was like, there was not many, there was no online streaming. So uh, to get on a, a job that got into a movie theater or onto a TV, that was like a, an epic thing. I mean, it, it took like five years of being in the industry to get, you know, be a loader on a real movie, you know, that played in movie theater. Yeah. So you feel that's changed quite a bit? Oh, since 100%. Then? I mean, now, now you, somebody gets fired as the boom op and they show up the next day in craft service, you know, like the, <laughs> you, people uh, excel so much quicker now. Mm. I mean, you, we just Good need more people the content. I just a thing. I don't really have an opinion on it. <laughs> That's my new my new uh, life view. I don't have an opinion on it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Great. Um. Did you? Uh, so it's interesting because you worked a lot early on with Ramin on a bunch of projects. Did you guys meet at SVA? Did you meet oh, in New York? A long, convoluted, boring story. You know, um, we met through another director, and you know. We made Man Push Cart, which was a little indie film for like, you know, under a hundred thousand bucks. And, um, you know, with a hand, we were such a small crew that the actors couldn't find us on the straight, same street corner we were standing on, literally, you know? <laughs> and I, I think uh, the camera came out of the case day one and we never put it back in the case until we finished wrapping. I mean, we were just shooting nonstop and the day ended when like the batteries died. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then you guys carried on from there and you did some really significant projects that got a lot of attention. Well, we had some fun. We did um, a real fun one called Chop Shop and we did a really cool little short film called Plastic Bag where this bag flies around and Werner Herzog's the voice of it. That one, that one's something I could still watch. Yeah. <laughs> it's very hard to watch my, in your own stuff, you know, but that one I, I actually kind of enjoy looking at. And then, You've had uh, just a really cool, awesome kind of neglected career where you've been doing commercials and TV and features, but you seem to kind of gravitate towards, you know, features, you know, early on in your career. And that was what you got into. Um, and then I guess, I mean, you tell me, but, you know, Paranormal Activity 2 is kind of the one that seems like it was the first one that really took it to another level for you. Yeah, well, I mean, like, what you do leads to more of what you do, right? So I, I was shooting features, and a lot of them didn't come out or had small release, and then they, that, that continued. And then, bizarrely, my f and like, and, and no one project ever elevates you to some new level. I, I, I wish it worked that way. They're just sort of like chipping away at the, you know, the the stone of a career. You know, <laughs> when you're hopefully at the end, it looks like something. But the um, my friend Kip got a job doing paranormal too it was super bizarre and then um the, he was allowed one person they, they, you know they were like we'll let you have one hire and he, he he brought me on and uh you know the, i had no idea the film was gonna be a hit we thought we were making like um it could it could have been like book of shadows it could have been like blair witch too you know we were really yeah. nervous about it but but then the audience super enjoyed it and 
I have a career with, you know, working with Jason Blum and that team over the years and stuff and developed a lot of fun relationships. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to pull up some images if that's okay. And sure. we'll kind of talk through some of these films and we'll start with paranormal activity too, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on just some of the, some of the challenges with each of these films, because I'm sure they're, they're all different and they've all got a different look and a different kind of approach to them. So love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, I'll start off by just saying, um, this is all pre 4k HD, you know? So <laughs> it, it, like it was a complete wild west of how to shoot something. This, uh, yep. well, I haven't seen this in a long time. The, 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 I used the Iconics cameras for this, which was not the best decision I've ever made. Um, they're very, they have their own use, but they're very specialty. The lenses are very for um, like uh, uh, medical stuff. So it's all for like focusing the camera like an inch away from the lens. So it was very difficult with, um, uh, setting the shots up over and over and over again and getting the frames again. So how would you guys approach these scenes? Would you just, would you set up in a certain room and then shoot out that entire room and do everything? Oh, I wish it was that logical. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, you should pre, be a producer. The, um, no, you, you get a, a five page treatment and it's super scary and you kind of just jam it and you kind of, kind of complete it and then you, they edit it they edit it in the house next door to where we're filming it and it's completely just jamming it, you know, and then eventually they come up with like scenes they like, and then we got to reshoot them. And then we decide we don't like someone's wardrobe. So we should reshoot it again. And then you complete that chunk of the movie, which is like the first 15 minutes. And then someone hands you another five pages and so it keeps going. And you assume there's somebody in a room that has all the pages, but I, right. I'm not sure if that's the case, you know? Right. And, and then like, we, we'll, we'll do a take where the actors hold the camera and you try that out for a while and then, uh, then I'll do it and, you know, the next day. But it, it took forever <laughs> to make that movie. I, it, I mean, that was, it was supposed to be like a 30 day shoot and it was like half a year or something. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. And if you were going to add your own acoustic score to this, what would it sound like? <laughs> <laughs> Be very moody. <laughs> very good. <laughs> yeah. And then um, the lunchbox. So this is this is a a beautiful little film, which really you know is that year was kind of a nice little breakout. But that I I'm curious how you know how you came about this project and what made you decide to take something like this on after doing paranormal. This film. Well, oh yeah, I assume there's many years between those two things, but the um. This one uh, gets played a lot on airplanes. <laughs> you know when you're on an airplane and they have to have like German movies and Indian movies? This is yeah. always on. And um, I, I haven't seen this since the edit, but I, I'm curious. I love this movie. And um, I got a phone call from Ritesh and he said, I got your number from the Sundance Lab and he liked some of the Ramin films. And um, he heard that I'm really into food and I'm, I'm into travel and food and stuff and would I be interested in that, this, shooting this movie and then maybe five days pass or something we have another meeting and I'm on a plane you know and, and then I'm in India for a quarter of a year making this thing wow it was very hard to film I mean, in, in India you could have a crowd of um, 5,000 watchers in five minutes you know I mean the, the, it's so dense the, like, shooting in New York City is difficult Mumbai is uh, another level. <laughs> I can only imagine. What an yeah, experience. Really difficult. Yeah, I mean, I think the first people they hire is the security team, like before they hire DPs or anything. Like, <laughs> because there has to be, um, you keep, uh, the crowds are just immense there. This is right. uh, Robin Hood. And then, yeah, last day of Robin Hood, which, you know, I, um, I had, I had been hearing about this film, you know, obviously on the, it's went out on the festival circuit and then the cast was drawing quite a bit, bit of attention, but it didn't really go anywhere. But I think it's a beautiful film and I think the story is really interesting. And um, it's scandalous, yeah. I, yeah, I'd love to just hear your take on approaching this with this type of cast and period. And it, it's, based, it's based on a really interesting book. And then um, Dakota's mom played by Susan Sarandon, that, that real person wrote the book. And it's just a total scandal story. And the directors asked me if I could, I bought the book on eBay 
for a lot of money. And the director said, oh, can we let you, uh, Susan borrow your copy of the book? I said, yeah, sure. And she never gave it back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, if Susan is watching this, <laughs> give me my copy of that book back. I really want it. Um, I think, it, yeah. So this movie, yeah, it's a scandalous thing. And I, I just think, um, I think if it premiered in Europe, it would have done better. Because it, it's just, basically, Errol Flynn sexually assaults a 15-year-old and they fall in love. So I, like, I don't think it's a tough pill to swallow for um, a yeah. Western audience. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And um, you had, uh, where did this, where did this shoot? I was in Atlanta. I was shooting a lot in Atlanta back then. And um, it, it, you know, that, that's a budget range. It's really difficult. It's like mm. 5 million. So like, like when I do indie, if I do an indie film now, like when I did White Girl, I said to them, I'm really excited about this project, but I don't want to shoot this like a real movie. You know, like, I don't want shot reverse shot. You know, I don't want, because mm. shooting it like a real movie is just, it means you just have $20 million less than other movies, you know? And um, $5 million, they want it to be like a real movie. You know, they want the coverage, they want the wide shots, they want all the establishing, and they want it to look pretty, but it's just not enough time, especially with that stuff which is single camera mm. you know I mean, the stuff i shoot now there's you know as many cameras as required <laughs> it's interesting the early days of i'm assuming this was pretty early for for um this was alexa was this one? oh i can't recall i yeah. assume but it was probably early for for just the whole digital transformation over to the mainstream and um back then yeah people were cautious about how many cameras but like you said now they'll throw as many cameras as they want oh yeah yeah, it, it was it was single. I, I think it was a single camera shoot. I mean, yeah. it was very small. I remember that there was a coffee table that was made out of solid stone, and most of my job was moving it around with the on set dresser. It was the heaviest pr uh, piece of set dressing I've ever been around that had to be moved for every single setup. <laughs> oh man! And then uh, nerve, and this is where I first remember meeting you, and. Uh, this was a fun project to work with you on. This was the best. I, lo I loved every minute of this. Um, fun c crew. Uh, these kids would show up on nights they weren't filming just to like hang out with us, you know? <laughs> and uh, Anthony Kanagas was the producer. He was so awesome. Uh, Doug Torres, the AD. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 every minute. And you know, the whole thing was uh, rock and roll madness. How do you make this thing look as crazy and, and weird as possible? Um, and I learned a lot from Henry and Rel. We would come to a location and it'd be perfect, except there's a giant pole in the room. And Rel would go, you know, we'd think about it. We'd say, maybe we can't deal with it. Maybe we could frame it out. And Rel's like, no, we, let's embrace it like Steven Tyler's mic stand. You know? <laughs> what a crazy idea. Like, and uh, now every time I see a problem, I'm like, let's make it about the problem. <laughs> and I love that you guys just went all out. It's almost got this really cool neon feel, the entire movie. Really bold colors. Well, yeah. and, uh, it, started off, it started off as a, um, like the design was going to be more like French Connection or, or like a rough New York. And, uh, mm. and me and the, the directors and Chris Trujillo, the, we, we all discussed this and we're like, New York doesn't look like that anymore. New York looks like hmm. Hong Kong. I mean, it looks more like Hong Kong than Hong Kong nowadays. You know, it, it's it, it it's very slick. Yep. And this is a perfect example of you guys. I I went to see this at the theater, knowing that this wasn't made for me. That this was more of like a young adult kind of thriller. And I'm watching this going. This is like a neo noir. This is really well done. I mean, I was engaged through the entire thing, and it was a lot of fun. And you, you guys, know, it was the, so kinetic. It's great. The kids would <laughs> dance in the theater during the credits, like, uh, and it's really, you know, for years I was making movies for such critical people. You know, if somebody goes to the Angelica Art Center, the Film Center, they go in wanting to hate the movie. You know, they, people that go into IFC like highly critical a teen goes into a movie just wanting to fall in love with the characters. And um, 
making nerve was was so and and since then kind of making movies for a larger audience and for teenagers and young people it's just way more fun yeah and then wow i mean moving on to halloween i know that this must have been really interesting because such an iconic film and then following suit it's not it's not a remake but it's in a way kind of um it's bringing back some of the classic stuff from the original and i bet this had to be a blast to work on <laughs> that one was hard i mean i mean of course i enjoyed it all and stuff but um david called me i know david green over the years and we did vice principals together and then he was like hey no need dps who are available to shoot my um i'm doing halloween and uh and then i wrote back and texted him back fine i'll shoot your dumb movie <laughs> and, uh, that was the beginning of the collaboration on that one and, uh, it, it was super fun you know i mean it's a challenge because halloween as a franchise is, is very difficult because there's two two different timelines to take and the films can't contradict each other so you have to yeah. decide which ones and and they, they were a real fun script to make but it's you know it's, it's nights it's, i mean it was cold we get a lot of against us in this one this this scene from the this is probably the best scene from the movie in my in my opinion i loved this scene and the way you guys captured it this is a this shot is super important in my life because it wasn't on the storyboard paul daly the camera operator said can i try to get a shot while you do you know, there's probably a camera inside the 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 vehicle that's the main shot you know and paul like <laughs> ran with the camera while the, the A camera slates are being hit, rolls his own camera and st steals this shot. And then there's a, a lot, a lot of times the best shots are like, awesome. they're just com completely falling off the truck <laughs> or from the hip. <laughs> no, that's great. But the whole scene played out so cleverly and, and it was really, really cool. <laughs> and that, that scene was done in one night. It, it, wow. it, was, it was a real challenge. Wow. It was, it was one of those days where the crew's like, the production's like, we're, we're willing to get you guys hotel rooms and no one drive, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I, mean, I remember driving with my head out the window. I was so tired at, oh, at the night. At, scary. At the end of the night, yeah. Yeah. And um, so you've, the other thing that's I think is interesting is that you've uh, then transitioned into television and you've been doing some television about that. I'm just curious what your take is on your approach to episodic versus long form feature. Well, I'll say if you find a group of people you like to work with, continue working with those people. <laughs> um, it's a rough world out there, man. The, uh, you know, at least Danny's the best. You know, David's the best. The, uh, the AT, AD team, the, you know, Richard Wright, the production designer, they work with the same people over and over and over again. So why not go back? If Danny wants to, me to be part of his comedy, I'll do that. If Danny wants me to be part of... Uh, Halloween Kills and David does, I'll do that. Um, <laughs> it's such a joy to work with these people. Uh, but in the transition of, you know, this show was brutal. This, show, I, I don't know what it was, but um, the page counts, the, the size of the, of the sides we get every morning, like how much we had to achieve and, and how many cameras is irrelevant. They'll give you whatever, cam as many cameras as you want, but you'll, you'll be doing a, um, full scene at 14 hours into the day and starting a new one and uh and i remember talking to like david or somebody i was like i just can't do it i can't figure out how to complete this thing in the next two and a half hours and uh i think david said like well pretend like you have to you know <laughs> which is <laughs> the situation i was like well if i had to i would do uh, push the camera in here and then maybe I'll slide someone's chair out and bring in the second camera like this. And then, you know, and like, and then you figure it out and then you're like, well, let's try, let's try to achieve that. Cause <laughs> in the end you could only, you know, it, when you're starting a scene at, you know, 14 hours, you only, you have to complete it in two setups. There's no, you know, two setups and maybe carry an insert or something. There's no, and there's no flipping the room around. This guy's the greatest actor ever. <laughs> Walter, I mean, he's a national treasure. When I came to uh, visit you on Gemstones down in Charleston, I remember, uh, you know, being on set there and watching him do a scene. And it was <laughs> really funny because he kind of almost stayed in character while he was 
off and he was just totally bonkers. It was, it was fun. Oh, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's always baby Billy when he's on jump stones. These uh, scenes are challenging. Um, so many, you know, dinner tables. It's not challenging. You, 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 there are three setups, but a lot of eye lines. And there's a lot, a lot of this in the show too. There's a lot of scenes where people are sitting, a lot of people around tables or in the congregation. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And you want to, you want to make it good. You know, you don't want to just hose it down. <laughs> That's good stuff. And I thought what also was interesting about gemstones is the locations. You guys kind of took over that mall down there. <laughs> Outside of Charleston. It was pretty yeah. Cool. <laughs> we actually, we work out of a mall. And uh, some of the, Paul Daly, my camera operator, he shot some of this stuff. And Brandon Trost shot the, uh, the pilot. I have no idea how they did that. I think they must use a crane the whole time. <laughs> that boat. It's great stuff. Yeah, it's a fun, fun episode, a fun show. We, we were just filming it until they got uh, shut down. We got two no, days, two days into season two. <laughs> Well, we're all excited for season two because we've been, that's all we've been talking about all week. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's going to be some surprises. <laughs> Danny's got some stuff up his sleeve. Oh, man. Yeah, colleagues of mine and stuff. We've been sharing the episodes and talking about some of the favorite scenes and stuff. And we're just like, oh, man, can't wait for season two. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they t I've got to say the television shows are harder uh, on me than the, the movies. The hours are more brutal, the weekends mm -hmm. are shorter. And the movies, at least, you know, it might take forty-five days, but or fifty, but there'll be there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So are you working with like the same crew now? Do you carry them over job to well, job? I, you know, as I always say, that it's their job to lose. You know, like they, <laughs> I love my crew, so as long as they keep on doing such a fantastic job, and it's it's like my Charleston, you know, crew. You kind of can't carry everybody around the world with you, you know, uh, so. My first assistant, Justin Simpson, he's been sticking around with me and I get him on everything I can do. Uh, Paul Daly, I try to bring on everything. And then I got a great gaffer, great uh, key grip. I do the um, South Carolina, North Carolina jobs. Yeah. How, how deep do you get in the technical with them? Very little. I mean, I, I don't know the names of the lights. You know, I, I, I tell them where I need the light. I need large, you know, a big soft thing coming through here. Um, I often say, what do you think? You know, and uh, I, I mean, I have opinions on everything, but like, especially with like long throws, you know, like for, of light, it, you really just listen to the big, the old dogs, you know, like, do I need an 18 or a 12 of them? They can figure it out like the crane size, you know, do I need a, an 80 foot or can I get away with a lower one? And um, <laughs> I would be an idiot to really try to micromanage them, you know? And like, especially with, with, with Lee, my key, key grip, you know, I'll think I can get away with an eight by and he'll be like, you need a 12 by, or, you know, like he'll, they, they know what they're doing. They do this day in, day out, you know? And also I like to see what different rags the, the guys throw on the, throw on the rigs, you know, hmm, let's see what, you know, soft frost looks like here let's see what I, you know like i'm not going to commit to uh using quarter silk for the rest of my life for you know the sun <laughs> i mean it's, it's fun to see what else people want to do you know but you gotta be politically nice when you don't like it <laughs> has there been has there been anything in your mind technically camera lighting anything that's really stood out this last couple of years it's been a game changer uh, everything the, the the LRXs, the Asteras, like the color changing technology. And uh, people can get bored of it really quick because it, it's, so, it's so overused. You know, like on Nerve, I think these things were just coming out. Um, but, you know, we, we really don't have much gels on the sets. But putting like, you know, a tobacco gel or, you know, something like that in front of a... Um, a maxi brute is going to have a much different, richer color than those LED things can ever create. It's not as delicate and infinite as people want to believe. You know, mm. yeah, the little rainbow things and things, and you know, but it all takes time. You know, and uh, it, you have to program it. Every light is basically controlled by a, a dude with an iPod now. That's kind of helpful. 
you know. Uh, as far as cameras go, I mean, I, I'm happy that we're finally seeing standardizations of cameras, you know, the, the Alexa being the Alexa for, I, how many years has it been, 10? It's 10 years now, yeah, 10. just over, yeah. Um, I've been doing a lot of LF shooting. I don't think I used the 65. Um, I don't have a deep opinion uh, on on um, the medium format stuff. I, it seems to look beautiful, so I keep on doing it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think the Halloween films, we've always used standard Alexas. There's something about the anamorphic thing, but maybe they've changed that. Right. No, I was going to ask you about anamorphic a little bit, because I think, you know, there's, there's actually a question from the audience was something I wanted to talk to you about, too. One of the one of the things that makes Halloween so striking, I think, is one, it was an independent film, but also it was a really unique use of anamorphic at the time. And I mean, that, that master in the beginning of the film and all the things that they did for a small film like that was pretty amazing, pretty creative. And then for you guys to kind of almost, I don't want to, I don't want to use the term recreate, but I, it feels like there was some pressure to use anamorphic again and to keep it that way. Well, I mean, I, I, I called up Dean Cundy and said, you know, will you give me some words of advice on this? He's a DP from the original. Yeah. He said, well, you're going to shoot anamorphic, anamorphic, of course, you know, like <laughs> it wasn't even like a, a debate, you know? And um, I mean, how, when you do a, a franchise movie, whether it be paranormal or Halloween, you have to um, identify the factors of what is the franchise, you know? So, uh, how paranormal for instance is found footage people with video cameras in a house like if it takes place if it's uh not found footage it takes place on a boat it's not paranormal it's a it's a new franchise it's something else and the uh, you have to think of these things as like um a continuation of a comic book you know so if, if things go too far off they're, they're no longer that thing and uh, part of Halloween, it's got to have Michael Myers, it's got to have Laurie Strode, and um, it has to be anamorphic. <laughs> Was that your first project in anamorphic? Oh, I've done commercials and stuff like that. Okay. You know, I was always kind of scared of it, you know, but um, especially with the area anamorphics, it, it's, it's very not intimidating anymore. You know, I, I remember thinking you needed a five six and all that stuff. I mean, it was such some TV movies anamorphic, I think, but um, it's not that different. The framing is is, is easier to frame. Hmm. Uh, things that are challenging is always close focus and like you can't crash crash dolly in and stuff like that. You know, hmm. but they now make those um, flat diopters, which are just unbelievable. Yeah, you don't want to break one of those though. <laughs> no, no, but expensive. <laughs> and then, yeah, we, so you and I uh, worked on a project last year in New Orleans. Oh, yeah. And it was really, I mean, I was sad I didn't get to visit you, but it sounded like a massive undertaking because it was a lot of visual effects. Yeah. You know, I, um, I, 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 you go into every project thinking you could, you're, yeah, I could do this. Yeah, great. I'm psyched you have a job. I look back on it, you're like, man, I was, I had no idea what I was doing. But um, I think we did a cool job. Uh, the movie hasn't come out yet. I'm not even sure what it's titled right now, but Henry and Rell directed it. And um, it was just a massive undertaking, as you said. Like, you would have, the A unit has three cameras doing a scene with, that goes on for a week of the craziest things you could imagine. And then, meanwhile, there's a stunt unit with two cameras, you know, in the, in the studio next door doing some crap. And then there's like an aerial, aerial unit flying around and you're somehow trying to like keep some owner, ownership over what's happening. You know? I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, the idea of like DP looking through the eyepiece and, you know, painting with light. I mean, you're just trying to like make the thing make sense. You know, it's so epic. And, uh, but, you know, there's the amount of people and the team and the intelligence. It's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, I've 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 always wondered how you like you said how do you keep your, you know, your impact on it, your vision going when you've got all of that happening around you. You've got visual effects supervisors and producers and stunt coordinators all in the mix. You know, it's got to feel like a pretty packed kitchen. You know, I I don't fear my ideas 
ever being watered down. That, that's not something I fear in life. You know, like if I cook dinner, if I cook you anything, it will always taste like I cooked it for you. You know, and if I shoot something, and also like, I'm just not good enough to copy somebody else. You know, I'm, I'm not good. I'm like, if, I only am going to do it the way I think it should be done. You know, so I, I'm, th that fear is, is not with me. Um, it's more just uh, the logistical challenges, you know, um, how to not move the GAC, as I say. You know, like you could spend the day shooting, you could sp spend the day moving the video village. And it's really part of your job to isolate where you're not seeing, where you could frame out, and uh, how to get the, st the stuff you need to work with as close to the shoot set as possible without hindering the shoot set. Hmm. You know, and that's where, where, you know, you separate your experienced people and your not experienced people. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, here's an interesting question from the audience. Have you ever said no to a project and curious why, why you may have, what were the reasons? <laughs> oh, have I ever said no? You know, it's just not the way, it's not the way the massage of uh, courtship works in, in the film. You know, like if, if you don't, if you're not interested in the project, some mysterious uh, thing happens in your life that you can't, you're not you're no longer available or, you know, there's another job that conflicts, but you know, that's, I don't think you're ever in a situation where you say, Oh, I have done it once where I said, yeah, I, I'm not interested in this project. And that was a terrible mistake in handling diplomacy. <laughs> I mean, like it, it really affected my career and uh, you should never tell somebody outright, you're not interested in their project. Uh-oh. <laughs> we'll have to take that one offline. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that, that was uh, a really um, bad idea. <laughs> well, um, Here's, I, I'm curious where this one's coming from. This must be one of your fans heckling you here. Cause uh, <laughs> they're, they're asking if you know how to play misbehaving from the righteous oh, gym, uh, guitar. I, you know what? I, I'll look it up, <laughs> but I will take requests you know, in, in these uh, uncertain times. You know, we need to hear some, some Beatles songs. That's right. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so a colleague of mine is asking what guitar you're playing and is music impact your aesthetic choices? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm at my mom's house, so I, there's a, uh, a Spanish guitar here. But I, I got a. Um, does music impact my choice? I, I love guitars, I love instruments. I got a lot of them, and um, I love music's my bigger love than movies for sure. I mean, I, working with light is the biggest bitch in the entire world. I mean. I need the, the, to hit here, but be dark here, and then bouncing off the ceiling, and there's a kick off a car down the. It, it is so challenging. To, it's, it's like a camera, as I say, is, is just a fancy pen, right? It's just there to record something. But like, at least paint you can keep separated, or there's some logic to it. Light is really brutal, and then um, the the aesthetics of like what people like is totally bizarre. You know, so, you know, all of a sudden like Rachel getting married will come out and people will love the way that looks and wants to make people <laughs> look like that. And then you're like, you guys hated when I did that. You know, now you want it to look like that? And then, um, you know, you're always, and then and everyone's a fucking critic, you know? So they, um, yeah, I'll hear a PA be like, it's a little bright over there. And then I'll be like, oh my God, you know, like it's really, it's a very difficult medium. It's, and cutting light is so challenging. But uh, the music doesn't affect the, uh, the movies. I wish I could come up with a nice analogy. <laughs> the, 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 the thing that I like about, uh, I like about um, music is I like all music. Like, one of the reasons I'm not a musician is because I don't know what I would want to play, what instrument or what style, because I love it all. Movies, I'm super particular, you know, I watch it, I'll be like, you know, this is shit, this is hype, this is, a ge this is genius, you know, and then I'll watch like Home Alone 2 and be like, man, this is one of the best directed movies I've ever seen. I mean, like, Home Alone, that guy, Chris Columbus, whatever his name is, he's so good. And then it's taken me a gazillion years to be pure enough to admit that I think that's good. 
you know? <laughs> or um, you watch something like The Rock, some a movie that I made fun of for, you know, a gazillion years. You're like, man, this is efficient storytelling. This is good. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, that's actually a nice little transition into uh, <laughs> a question that came in about genre. And if you have a preferred genre, if there's one you would not do. <laughs> there's nothing I won't do. You know, let me... Um, Horror is certainly the most challenging of all genres. The, um, you go work with, you know, Danny McBride and Walter Goggins, you're going to laugh your ass off all day. I mean, it's, it's going to be hard. But those guys are going to do their things. And you're going to do a, a drama and you'll be like, well, uh, Susan Sarandon, you're so amazing in the scene. You know, you're like, you'll, you'll, you, you feel emotion. But um, you do a horror film, you're like, is this POV, steady cam POV of the blood going up the stairs scary? Can I see too much of it? Is it, is it effective? Does it feel like we're the POV? You know, you're just doubting yourself. And you're just, and I mean, a paranormal, you're just like watching dark rooms and like maybe a, like an event would be a, a pot shake in the background. You know, like it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't give you immediate feedback. Mm. <laughs> you know, but the, the, the reality is when it, it's, it's all completed, it gives you by far the most feedback, you know, so when you see an audience go completely mental. Yeah. I always, I, I don't know. I always kind of categorized horror in the movie realm as jazz in the music realm because hate it. No, no, I actually, I actually love it. I love it. But you can, you, you know, in order sometimes to achieve something really special, you have to break the rules and you have to think outside the norm. And it's sometimes it's not going to quite work or fit, but it comes together and then all of a sudden it's magical. You know, it's like, I mean, the checkerboard scene is a good example of that in Halloween where um, that was not, we were scouting that location for something completely else. And then, uh, I was like, David, isn't that fun? And Richard's like, yeah, Richard Wright, the designer, was into it. But it was like, but this is not a prison. And I was like, let's just pretend it is. <laughs> like, I mean, th this part of the process doesn't cost any money, money, you know, like ideas are free. And then so we just uh, jammed ideas. It's like, David, where would you put Michael Myers if you happened to do it? You know, he's like, I'll put him right here. I said, well, would you put anybody else? He goes, maybe I would do this and this. And then through this and then th there was major problems there was like windows and doors everywhere and i'm like richard how would you handle that and he was like i could deal with this that way and this is visual effects and uh then we walked out of there being like this is where the michael myers is kept and it's so much better because the reality is like it was written as if it was the jail from um silence of the lambs you know, the, the jail below the jail, you know, where they keep all the real ones. But like, that's a set and sets are really expensive. And, you know, Halloween was a low budget movie. I mean, fairly low budget movie. Yeah. So operating. So uh, do you do your own operating? Do you, I mean, I know you've been speaking about an operator you work with, but how often do you operate your own camera? I mean, there's just a reality with, DPing, which is if I operated the camera all the time on nerve on, on uh, like Henry and Rail's latest film, I would be the most incompetent person to ever shoot an eighty million dollar film. Like you, there's too many cameras, and so what would I? It, it's just a straight up pragmatic thing to have to give it up, you know. So I love operating the camera, and I'm I like to think I'm pretty darn good at it, and. Um, I, it's my favorite thing on, on the job, but in the end, uh, and if I was to do like a, a, a million dollar film, I'd probably do it, but it needs to be single camera. I, I can't handle the multiple cameras and operating. Now, sometimes it's just easier for me to take over and do a shot than explain it. And especially under high pressure situations, when I have somebody getting a little nasty to me, it's just better that I go do it than... I get talked to nastily, then I have to go talk to an operator nastily. It, it doesn't, it, it chain of events doesn't work out well. Um, but operating is one of these things, the operator I use, Paul Daly, he's a DP. So 
he could do all the second unit stuff. I mean, he, he was like Ellen Curtis's gaffer for projects. So he's a great lighter. Um, I could bounce ideas off him. I could send him out with the camera to go do something else. He could also like help, he could help run a set. Cause a lot of the um, operating a camera, being, being a, operating a camera and being a camera operator are two completely different things, right? Like anyone, my mom could operate the camera, but mom can't be a camera operator. Cause camera operator run, is part of a department that works with the sound guy to get how close can the boom get and uh, communication with the dolly grip and working with the onset dresser to how to clear crap out and a gazillion things. And them or I are really helping run the set when the AD hands it over to us. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I do enjoy it. And there's, there's actually a question coming in about making those transitions, you know, and if you have any advice for people that are either operators or gaffers that want to make the jump to a cinematographer. You know, I, I don't believe in the concept of advice as much as I like to talk about myself. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I mean, like, I don't fucking know. I mean, the, if you're a great AC, nobody wants you to not be an AC. So like, they're, they're, the only thing you can do is decide once and for all you are going to do X, Y, Z things in your life and you're going to shoot every damn thing. People will let you shoot and, and don't expect anyone to help you. I mean, like, why would somebody want the greatest dolly grip to become a shitty beginning camera operator? You know, why would somebody want like the greatest camera operator to be a, a decent DP? It's not, it's not, it's no one's interest. So uh, <laughs> I, I, most likely no one's going to help you. I, I'm in a situation where uh, I, I, with my operator where it's, I'm just, it's just too much work for me. So it's really great to have somebody I trust that can go uh, knock out some shots or see, some days or, you know, half an episode or something that why well, I have to do something else color correct or something like that. Hmm. <laughs> There's um uh, friend and DP of ours that's on that's asking some interesting questions. Uh, Matt Hopful has chimed oh, in. Oh, hey, Matt. <laughs> He's asking about, do you have a single favorite shot or setup that you've ever done? Well, I like that movie Plastic Bag because I like watching the bag go. In, um, there was a moment in my career where, like, when you do indie things, you, you basically run the whole set and everyone has to do what you, what you think. And then when you do bigger films, you're just another piece there's another cog in the machine of the movie, right? So like, you kind of can't do as wacky things. And um, on a plastic bag, like every single shot, the frame rate's slightly different and the shutter's slightly different. You know, like I was really experimenting with that and, and playing things in reverse. So that bag looks really cool. You know, and also my wife, then girlfriend was my AC at the time. And she was terrible. And I, but I thought she was an AC, she, but because she was doing crew stuff. But it turns out that was her first AC job, and uh, she always put the camera together wrong. And it was one of these like thirty-five millimeter adapters on one of the video cameras, so the lenses were never properly set. They were always like, like shift and tilted. You know, like so the focus was never. <laughs> and it, and she would also like not know that you have to take the lenses out of like, air conditioning rooms and they fog up and stuff. So half that film, the lenses are like, the focus is all weird and the camera's fogged on the inside and it ended up giving it like a totally interesting look. I was gonna say, you should be taking credit for that. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I was probably angry at the time, you know, but the, um, uh, you know, but it, the mistakes are cool, you know. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I mean, often I light something and then I'm like, all right, now it looks like the thing it's supposed to look like. Now, how do we make it look interesting? Or how do we make it look mistakey? You know, and it's usually like smash a Jolico into a mirror or something, you know? Right, right. So, so, I, Cause you need some sense of randomness to make something look interesting, you know, mm. or else it looks like, uh, you know, a fucking um, like Downey commercial or something like that, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not interesting to look at. I mean, that's the bottom line, but I remember reading this, uh, Rel was telling me about this Jonathan Demme article, which I always claim to have read, but never read. But it's supposedly in the article, Jonathan Demme says, cinema is teasing the eyeball, you know? And um, obviously you can't sum all these things up in one phrase, but it really is just what's fun. You know, what's fun to look at. And like, prag 
logic and pragmatism is the enemy of the filmmaker. You know, like, where is the light coming from? Oh, where, this light has to come from the window because there's a window there. Or like, uh, why is that light blue? Is that, uh, is that from a lamp? You know, like, it doesn't matter. Like, where the light is sourced, as long as it looks interesting. And like, the best DPs jump the key light all the time. You know, there's no, there doesn't need to be, wait, wasn't the light coming from that direction? <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's uh, so that again, another question that kind of that streamlines right into, I think is interesting is, you know, how much time do you spend on set creating a look versus how much time do you say, listen, we're going to have to deal with that later in the DI or whatnot. So. It's an, uh, it, once again, interesting question, but um, depends what stage film you're at, who you're working with. I mean, I, when I did the new film with Henry Rell, which I, who knows if this, these are good ideas or bad ideas? That's just what I did. The, um, I was like, no DI, DIT, because there's too many cameras, too many units. If I start like getting creative on the set, we'll never make a movie. You know, we'll never complete mm -hmm. the fucking thing. So then, um, but on like White Girl or something like that, you know, in any film like that, it's all in camera. I mean, I, I mean, of course, the, they do a great job in the color correct, and those guys are fantastic, but it kind of looked like the thing that was in the camera or a man push card. I think I was doing internal looks and stuff, but like you really, uh, you don't want to shoot too dark, you know? I mean, so, and it, it happens and some people love it. And then, but it's, it's for someone that works day to day in, in the career that can really screw you up. Yeah. Uh, be, be accused of shooting something too dark. <laughs> Fun question came in about rock and roll biographies. And have you read any? I, re I read all <laughs> rock and roll biographies. <laughs> Is there one that you would turn into a movie? <laughs> well, there's a one that um, uh, there's a short story about Hank Williams called Glass Bottom Cadillac that should be a, a movie. Like, it's only 20 pages. It's an outline, so it, it'd be. Um, but other ones who think uh, Guns and Roses that could be a good one. Ace Freely, <laughs> that guy's a nutcase. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I'll read anything on any rock musician. I don't, I don't give a shit. If, I, I'll read like the autobiography of Al Jorgensen from Ministry, like, a band I don't even like, but uh, I, just, <laughs> I just love the stories. We're getting and a the, lot. <laughs> and, ahead, and, and, and all those stories are total BS. It's always like Mickey Six talking about all I did was drugs and sex. And you're like, Hey, I know drug addicts. They don't have a lot of sex. <laughs> like... <laughs> so we're getting a lot of uh, musical requests, and we're gonna have to uh, say that for the last. Right, what are you asking? <laughs> That's great. That. I got I got everything from Tom Petty to the Halloween theme. Oh, the Halloween theme! <laughs> I, have to, I have to break out my 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 Ob one for the Halloween theme. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> um, a very specific question about lighting and how do you deal with the set that's mostly white walls or something like that? Uh, okay, how do you deal with the set about white walls? I mean, some what's that guy's, the British dude loves that stuff. Shame, what, what, what's his name? He's great DP. Uh, uh, Seamus McGarvey? No, 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 Shame is the movie he shot. Oh, Shame, uh, oh, so Sean Bobbitt. Sean Bobbitt, yeah, he's into like, <laughs> high gloss white wall stuff um i mean i guess you embrace it right i mean but, but i'm always trying to black out everything you know i'm trying to bl put black on the ceiling black on the floor like i'm trying to um limit how much contamination is is happening i mean like but a white just because a wall is white doesn't mean it's be behaving in any other way light is handled any object which is it doesn't want to be lit from the behind the camera you know so th th it's the same with like um just because some it's a it's a overcast day doesn't mean there's no lighting I mean, it just means it's much subtler i mean there's still you know a source and that's why you know i walk around with my hand like this to resemble a face and then i'm kind of going like this to figure out what what's they're reflecting off of and what's it coming from um but you know, like, that's why I like work with Dave and Danny because they have their production designer, Richard Wright, you know, and that guy makes some of the major heavy decisions in those projects. Yeah, I mean, he's the one that chooses the stuff. He's the one that, you know, he's a, he was 
a cinematographer student at, uh, at North Carolina School of the Arts. So he understands the layering and you want to shoot through this and, you know, I'll give you some lamps here. He's like, but we want, to, one thing I, I never want to, my a set I shoot to look like a lamp store, which is a major problem nowadays. But, but you know, you just, you see way too many floor lamps everywhere. Um, but yeah, yeah, you hope the designer has a concept. Because ultimately it's, they're saying the look. I mean, I, I hear about designers that, in different countries, and I don't want to say names, but like that, uh, say, you know, we need to the DP, we need some sort of pink here. We need some sort of blue in the, in the distance, you know, which I, wow. I think is interesting. Yeah. Um, so there's a question about, do you have a mentor? Is there a cinematographer that you admire and really look at inspires you? I wish. Uh, um, but, you know, so there was, I did, I did all these indie films and then I got, um, I did my first union film. And uh, I think it's called like America, it's American Loser or something like that. But uh, I got my ass kicked. I got my ass destroyed. And um, it really shook me up because I thought everyone's gonna wanna know like, ooh, what's this guy gonna do? He's, he's, you know, care about the lighting and shit. But like, I realized they just cared about where the trucks get parked, you know? And then as the years have passed, I realized where the trucks get parked is the most important decision of the day. So there, there was something there. And I realized I didn't really know what I was doing. So I, um, I was friendly, I'm friendly with this uh, DP named Bobby Bukowski and um, he operates his own, himself, but he they had to hire a camera operator. So I would um, go, you know, be an operator, but it really just was helping carry the cases around, you know? And I did this because I wanted to see how somebody else handles this. And Bobby would handle his sets like a gentleman. He would, ne he would never throw shit or yell or whatever. And basically, I, I basically copied him. I mean, I just copied the way he talked, you know, and uh, I still do to this day. And uh, I'm a huge personality, but on set, I try to be a gentleman. I try, I try to address everybody as Mr. and Mrs. And um, I find that, you know, if I call you Mr. Gus, if I say, uh, Hey Gus, you're really fucking up today. Yada yada yada. But if I say, Mr. Gus, you're really letting me down today, buddy. You know, like you could handle it so much better, you know. And, uh, and that's why I, I try to keep a gentlemanly set. Nah. <laughs> and I'm like absurdly polite, but like films. I'm I'm really interested in how uh, airplane pilots communicate to uh, the the whatever the radio tower dudes, because it's like. All right, blah, 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 got you. And like, through that, they understand this airplane is going to go land on this runway at this specific moment at this JFK, you know, by very efficient communication. And I'm a chatterbox in my real life, but you want, yes, sir, no, sir, copy, understood, dolly track here, five feet here, what's the ETA? Because uh, I'm just trying to coordinate the ETAs of all these things. It's not that I'm trying to rush anybody. I'm trying to make sure that they all happen simultaneously and we're not waiting for one thing or the other thing. <laughs> well, that's great. And one last question from a Mr. Henry. Hey, Henry. <laughs> is uh, asking if you can walk us through your, uh, your hair care routine for the day. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, so uh, <laughs> that's actually funny. My hair care routine, um, I drank too much last night. So then I basically have been going between this, I've been jumping into the freezing cold pool over and over and over again at trying to uh, wake myself up and it's working and I feel like a million bucks. And, um, and then I let it uh, drip dry like a, like a dog. And I can't even like this. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, I need some exit music, if you would, please. Um, <laughs> exit music? Your choice. Oh, I don't know to play you. <laughs> now, I, now, now I feel under the spotlight. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it, folks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. That was no a problem. blast. I'll a lot of fun. All right. Take care. <laughs> All right. We hope you all join us again and look forward to seeing... Um, our guest, Sean Peters, on Friday on our next episode. So please join us then. And um, all of our episodes will be available on our website, airyrental.com, where you can also check out all of our unique and exciting products. 
offered by Airy Rental. And you can follow us on youtube.com forward slash Airy Rental Group. All right, everybody. Until then, cheers. <laughs>